ancient Jews believed that, mm -hmm. if Christians believe that, so what's the excuse for the Muslims not to believe that? Hey everyone, welcome to the Jesus King Podcast. Hopefully you're doing well. I'm here with Abraham. How are you doing, Abraham? Yeah, yeah, good to be here. Um, today well today is going to be a nice topic. Yeah. Um, it's a topic that we have... We haven't even actually closely touched on. No. And that would be the idea that God of the Bible and Allah of the Quran mm. are the same God. Yes. Right? Yeah. And this obviously gets introduced by Muslims uh, because it's part of their doctrine. Yeah, it is. They are the fulfillment of the three religions, right? You had... The people of the books, which are the Jews and the, and the Christians. And lastly, God spoke to the Arab people mm -hmm. through the Arab prophet, which is Muhammad. And he obviously gave the final revelation, which is the Quran. Yeah. Right. As uh, the final prophet as well. Yeah. So, yeah. So the idea is when you evangelize to the Muslims, they always say, well, we do believe in the same God, mm -hmm. but... Your Bible is corrupted. Um, Jesus was a Muslim. Yeah. And the God that you believe in, or the one that you're supposed to believe in, mm. is the Allah of the Quran. Mm -hmm. And for us, obviously, that's a point of dispute because the nature of God in the Bible, which is his triune nature, mm -hmm. we've got three persons in, in God, and the Tawheed yeah. in, in, in the Quran, which is there's only one person within God. Unitarian. Yeah. yeah. And there is no such thing as three persons. There's no such thing as father and son because mm -hmm. Allah doesn't have any children. Therefore, Jesus is not a divine person. Yep. He's not an eternal person. He's just a prophet. He's mm -hmm. a messenger. And we just as Christians have got it wrong. Okay. So can we just maybe start somewhere? Yeah, there? yeah. Well, the, my my first exposure to it, and it's a, it's an interesting thing because we both come from Middle Eastern backgrounds. Yes, we do. Um, and so our parents, and even you firsthand, you were born in that area. Um, you see firsthand the disparity between Islam as a religion and what you believe as a Christian, right? Mm -hmm. And you've seen that your theology informs your practice and your theology informs how, not just how you view God, but how you will view people, how you, how you view salvation, how you view any doctrinal or, pra or, or ecclesiastical practice. So one of the things for us is my, you know, my parents, they came from the Middle East. Your parents came from the Middle East. They come here. There's no way that they could say, Islam and Christianity serve the same God because they've seen firsthand the the fruit of right? each. Okay. Of each, they've seen the fruit of you know. Well, let's say uh, Islam, we see the fruit of it, okay, and then we see Christianity, we see the fruit of it. Mm. All right, and so it violates the law of non-contradiction when you say, well, these two opposing theologies can actually be the same. Or serve yeah. the same master, and you know I remember being in um, in Bible college, and I had a professor, you know, extremely intelligent, two PhDs. This is a person who just had a knowledge way beyond me, and I was giving her a ride home one night, and she's been in ministry for a long time, and she's ministered to Muslims. And on the ride home, I was only eighteen years old at this time. I'm driving, and she's talking to me and she's asking me my opinion about Islam and I'm telling her my opinion and she's like well I think you're actually wrong and I'm like okay why is that and she spent about an hour trying to persuade me that the Islamic God and the Christian God are the same God mm -hmm. historically what they've believed um, and it's just we have a, a different view of how that looks and how we practice that mm -hmm. and I was very confused because I'm like well you know, even at 18, I'm younger and way younger than you. I'm less educated than you. But, man, I've read the Word of God. And I had read, um, you know, portions of the Quran as well. And so I'm like, you know, I'm going to go home and I'm going to read the Quran in its entirety. I wanna, I'm want i going to list the details 
the differences in details between Allah and Christianity or to see whether they're the same because like I gotta we've got to figure this out we've got to be Bereans we've got to do our due diligence and be like okay well what are the major differences because there are similarities in that we believe there is one God we believe he's the creator of heaven and earth and hell we believe that he is eternal right but it's kind of like all right, at that point it it ends with the similarities and the differences outweigh and yeah. like you were saying the huge one which is like you know the nail in the coffin is the um the nature of god the very structure of how god existed pre you know the creation of the world yeah and how he exists now well you could have two phds but if you can't make that distinction, I don't know how smart you are. Well, I'll question that. Yeah. <laughs> well, this is this is what I mean. Well, yeah. When I say you're educated, I mean you can be in seminary all your life. Yeah. But but see, there there's an ignorance when you're outside of a context, and we in the Western world, we're out we are outside of an Eastern or Middle Eastern context, and we don't see the fruit of it. All what we see is okay. Um, what do these people say? And the Muslim people say, well, no, we serve the same God. So we listen to them. And I remember after the whole 9-11, uh, the whole 9-11 yeah. bombing, the, they inter a lot of Christians interviewed imams and they had the imams come to the churches to discuss the differences between Islam and Christianity. And a lot of the imams were saying, we, we honor Jesus even more than you Christians. You know, we honor him. We believe in him. You know, he yeah. is our prophet. Right. And. Christians are like, oh, well, they honor Jesus. So maybe there isn't much of a difference without actually diving deep. We can't live in ignorance. And another portion of this, another aspect of it is Christians are like, well, maybe we need to team up with the Muslims, with Orthodox Jews, with people of faith team up in an ecumenical way because secularism is on the rise and atheism is on the rise and that's a greater enemy. Wouldn't you rather team up with someone who has faith um, against the atheists, right? Yeah, yeah. And so it's like, well, you know, the enemy of my enemy is my friend kind of thing. So we look at that from a religious perspective. We're like, all right, well, should we just be ecumenical and we just admire or like, accept the similarities we have and don't worry about the differences because we have a greater enemy out there yeah right? but our differences obviously will influence our salvation of course and it influences because, the way we view god yeah. it influences everything yeah. Be because the person that they would call prophet mm -hmm. jesus being a mere prophet is the person that said i am the way the truth and the yes. life no one can come to the Father except through me. And who claimed deity as well, yeah. who claimed so, Godhood. So the idea that if Jesus comes and saying, I am the only way to God, mm -hmm. the Father, um, and then you have a religion, a new religion rising, and say, no, we have our own way to God, yeah. and we are a completion to your religion, mm -hmm. we have the final prophet with us, yeah. we yeah. might share similarity and that's a common thing, right? If you want to claim to be a continue, continu, continu, continuation continue. of something, you obviously have to take some of what they had yep. and introduce something new. Mm -hmm. With Muhammad, he believed that Jesus was miraculously born. Mm -hmm. He believed that Jesus was perfect, yep. right? He was the only human being that was perfect one without sin and yeah. lived without sin but then when it comes to salvation which is death resurrection ascension doesn't hold to that oh, well they do hold to ascension they believe that allah took jesus away mm -hmm. but the death and the resurrection they don't believe in that which is the cornerstone of our that's faith. yeah that's the so, core of our faith yeah. that jesus died for our sins and was resurrected for our justification mm -hmm. and if you don't get to hold on to that then how do you have new life? How are you born again? Yeah. How are you in the kingdom of God? Mm -hmm. And notice Jesus always spoke about the kingdom of God in the Gospels as his kingdom. Yeah. You know, if, if my servants fall for me, my, but my kingdom is not of this earth. Yeah. So the idea that he's claiming the kingdom of God to be his very own kingdom, mm -hmm. there he's implying that he himself is God. So the nature of Trinity, you always have an objections right yeah. one plus one plus one equals three yeah 
to Christians, they seem to be smart, but one plus one plus one equals one. Yeah. Um, they always straw man the idea. Yeah. Right. Um, so to you, if you were speaking to a Muslim and he says, your God mm. is a Muslim God. Yeah. But you've twisted him into... We've falsified yeah. the record. Yeah. Y- you've changed him into these three persons and one God, but it doesn't make sense. How could you answer something um, like that for Firstly, yourself? for Christians, especially when we're, we're um, speaking to Muslims who, are, who understand their faith and who know, you know what they're talking about from the Quranic side, you have to have a good bibliology. You have to have a good theology. You have to know... You know, the transmission of our text. Now, it's not falsified. It's one of the most... It is the... When it comes to evidence and when it comes to transmission, it is the most accurate in any historical record. The Word of God, both the Old and the New Testament canon, it is so accurate in its transmission that it... Like, it's been scrutinized. No book in history has been scrutinized as much. So the Muslims do do say this, and I've had a lot of Muslims that, you know, I have Muslim friends. One of my, a, a close friend of mine is a Muslim. We have that. And when they speak to us and when they speak about these things, they know they don't have a foothold when we know what we're talking about. We understand the history of the word of God. We understand the history of the transmission. And if you say it's been falsified, you have to prove that. And it has not been falsified. Right. Yeah. Um, and so that's where you have to have a good bibliology. You have to understand transmission of the text, but then you have to understand. All right. Well, the transmission of the text is clear and accurate. What does the text now say yeah. about who God is and just, what God is? Just a little point before you continue. In fact, if you study the history of Quran, mm. there came a time where they burned all the different Qurans. That is true. That and is true. they had a you know, a copy yeah. and they said, well, that's the, this is the yeah, this but is then the issues is when you study historically, mm-hmm. some of them said, well, we had this many sources. Yeah. We had that many yeah. sources, yeah. but the current Quran doesn't even have that many sources. Yeah. It's actually so, a very, it's actually a small book com- in is. comparison yeah. to, to the new Testament and the old yeah. Testament put together. It's a much smaller book and we don't know how big it would have been before they had burned all the other copies and whatnot. Yeah. And so, in speaking about these things, and a lot of Muslims are actually don't really know much about that side of the history because a lot of it is in the hadiths, and yeah. so you have m- hundreds of hadiths. Like it's, but, it's it's it's. Yeah. But many people don't even go and research. No, no, so don't. the idea is that if your um, sheikh said that the Quran is perfectly preserved, mm-hmm. you go out there and tell people tell about them. it. Yeah. But when you study your own history, you find hold on, the Bible's preserved yeah. my book doesn't seem to be preserved but just back to that point yeah. like the a good the bibliology whole... and in a good theology yeah. um, so we know the text being transmitted in history the word of god it is accurate it's been scrutinized even 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 atheist new testament theologians are like man we, we can't really fault the transmission it is the best that we have today compared yeah. to any other um, historical source so then we go to the text and we say, what does it say about who God is, right? And we know the historical Christian faith, based on what the Word of God says, is it structures the, the God, the eternal God, as multiple in personhood, but one in being, in essence. Mm. So in essence, one God, okay? But in personhood, three. Mm. Because we see three three persons in the trinity who are all in eternal communication eternal fellowship the father right that is the one who is majorly revealed in the old testament the son the word of god who is mainly manifested in the new testament mm-hmm. all right but we do see his manifestations in the old as christophanies and theophanies and that kind of thing especially in you know remember the genesis account with sodom and gomorrah we see a yahweh in heaven we see a yahweh on earth and so we see we see portions of that veiled in the Old Testament, but in the New Testament fully revealed that there is a father who is the person, you see a son who is a person, and you see the Holy Spirit who is a person. And all three of those share in the same divinity, in the same, in the same being and essence of God. They are omnipotent, they are omnipresent, they are um, omniscient, knowing all things. 
And Jesus, being the full embodiment of God, shares in those things. Even while he's on earth, where his glory is veiled, yeah. he knows the hearts of men, all men. Right? He didn't need anyone to tell him. The book of John speaks of it. He didn't need anyone to tell him who, what was in the hearts of men because he knew. How does he know? No one knows it. Do you know what's in my heart? No. 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 There is no person that knows that. Yeah. Right? I'll be very popular if I do. Yeah. Um, okay. So <clears throat> the idea that you brought is in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, we can see the triune God. Mm -hmm. In the New Testament, we obviously see a more clear, yep. more emphasized, but that doesn't mean that the Old Testament didn't teach it. No, no. It's all, yeah. So... And also ancient Jews believed in the plurality of yeah, persons. They, they believed in the in Godhead. This, even the, the two powers in heaven yeah. kind of thing. Yeah. So if ancient ancient beliefs uh, ancient Jews believe that, mm -hmm. if Christians believe that, so what's the excuse for the Muslims not to believe that? Because mm -hmm. they even get the Trinity wrong yeah. when they go um against it, right? They say Allah doesn't have a child. Yeah. And when they speak about the Trinity, they don't say Father, Son, Holy Spirit. A lot of them say Father, Mary, Son, the Son, and Mary. Yeah, and Mary. So they have a natural view of the term Father and Son. Yeah. They thought that the people that believed in Trinity... There's a physical relationship. Yeah, there's a yeah. physical relationship between Father and Mary, mm -hmm. and they had the, the Son, which is Jesus. Th their view of what we think we believe mm -hmm. so the the view that they say we believe is that the it's probably closer to mormonism in that god actually has sexual relationship with mary and then jesus is born and yep. so they believe that we the trinity the holy trinity is the father mary and jesus yeah right? and so it's kind of like you know in john 3 when jesus is speaking to nicodemus and he's talking about spiritual things about being born again and nicodemus is taking it physically yeah, like, and thinking in in a fleshly lens, the spiritual things of God, and it's a similar thing. There are times where you you speak about Jesus being the Son of God, and they look at that as being a fleshly, physical thing, as though you're a father, you have a son. There was a process by which that son was conceived, right, mm. and and born, and they translate that in the same way to the relationship of God. And you're like, no, no, this is a pre-existent, eternal thing. Yeah. That the Father and the Son have always existed. And, you know, we understand it even in, in regards to the triune nature of God. That, you know, when John speaks about the Son, he speaks about him as the pre-existing Word. Right? Yeah. That word Son generally is for our adoption and in the incarnation of, of Christ. So in the incarnation of God, the term Son comes into play. Right? Cool. And and in the Old Testament, we see, you know, a... a, um, a prophecy of that but either way we have to we have to correct the the in, inaccurate beliefs they have about what the trinity is that's what i've noticed i, I mean not only their <clears throat> not only their writings mm. but also when you go in evangelism they have a wrong view of trinity yeah and they attack that view and yeah. you're like we don't even believe in that view mm. that's not even biblical yeah. Like the the persons are in the Trinity. Mm -hmm. Mary's not even in it. No, no, no. She's it's, a human being yeah. who's in need of saving. Yeah. It's it's the Holy Spirit. So at least get our beliefs right. That's right. And then let's discuss exactly. it. Exactly. Well, it's it's like um one of the greatest antidotes mm -hmm. to falsehood is to know the truth. Right? Yeah. So if you wanna if you wanna stay away from error first you have to know what the truth is and like it's no point you going and debating a muslim if you don't even know what you believe yourself yeah don't don't even don't even speak don't even debate if you don't know what you believe yourself why you believe it i like a good example of that um someone was sharing they said when they want to teach someone how to find um counterfeit notes a counterfeit yeah, yeah. note they teach them how to study the real one. That's right, yeah, yeah. And if there is anything other than that, you'll know it's yeah. false. Yeah. So we spoke about the nature, yeah. right? There's Trinity, and there's much more to talk oh, about, so obviously. But now I want to speak about how God of the Bible, his relationship towards mm. the believers, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and how he treats them compared to the Allah of the Quran and how he treats his own followers, yeah. right? I'll, I'll, I'll touch on that by touching on one thing, one aspect of the Trinity is as well. 
when we talk about, and we might do one um, an episode on God being love, but we, we talk about it, part of um, our, our fundamental theology is God is love, mm. right? He is the epitome, he's the demonstration of love, but love is active, right? And so you can't say that God has eternally been love if he has been single, unitarian, without the persons existing. Because if God is love, that love has to predate and pre-exist creation of anything to demonstrate love to. Yeah. So we say God is love, all right? God is is one who is sacrificing for the benefit of another, all right? Mm-hmm. That can work if he is triune. It can't work if he's unitarian. And that then flows into the creation order. So if we say, yes, God loves the world, we can say he loves the world because he loves within himself, right? Yeah. And now he's demonstrating that to others as well. So basically when you say it's part of God's nature to love, before the world began, mm-hmm. um, Allah would be not self-sufficient, yeah. no. right? Yeah. Because he well, needs he someone to love. Well, we, we say that he's not, it's not that he's not self-sufficient, but he can't be love. He can't have love. If he has any kind of love, it is very, 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 um, it's relational. It's, re- it's relational and it's it's conditional. Cool, right? It's conditional in that it began at a certain point that is in the creation of men, and it will end with the death of that person, right? Mm-hmm. So any kind of emotion that he has, any kind of um, uh, compassion or any kind, it, it's limited to just this temporary point in time. Cool. Yeah. So how does Allah and God treat their followers? So. This is where we say it flows out of that. So when we talk about Yahweh, we talk about him being a, a it, in the Old Testament, we say, you know, he's a jealous God. But that word jealous, that zealous, is a passion. He is a God of, of, of passion for those that, that he cares for, his people. And he's willing to do anything and everything for them to come to a place of truth, safety, security in him. Mm. All right? And so he's... He's demonstrated that. He says, you know, um, that God demonstrates his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, he dies for us. Yeah. Right? So that's one of the big ones because we weren't even his followers when he died for us. We were his enemies and he dies for us. Okay? So even excluding his followers, he loves the world. He loves those who spit on him. He loves those who, who dishonor him in their sin, who have pride who have arrogance he loves them so much that he demonstrated his that through his own death right so he was incarnated now when we turn to the islamic view of who god is that's far that there's a disparity there god it, it would be a complete dishonor in islamic theology to say that god would condescend and take part in human play or in human form to to appeal or appeal to human beings, to his own creation. Mm. God does not humble himself in that way. God does not show love in that way. And his love is very conditional based on the obedience of those that call themselves Muslim by, you know, following the five pillars of faith, you know, doing the Hajj, the Zakat, the Psalm, all, all of those, those fundamental teachings. As long as they are doing those to perfection, then he can demonstrate some love to them and compassion. Right. Okay. So it's it's works based, definitely. So so the idea that um in the in the Bible and that includes the Old Testament and New Testament, mm-hmm. God's salvation was to go through the cross mm-hmm. to save his people, right? And in the Islam version, God doesn't enter creation. No. No. And basically, everyone is a slave, and therefore, you have to do your best to impress the God of the yeah. Islam. Yeah. And obviously, you also have to believe in his prophet mm. and everything that that prophet says. Well, there's an aspect of that in the, like you were talking about being a slave, because our view of God is father. Their view of God is not. He's yeah. not a father. He's not I, their father. I like how David Wood would say, he says... Allah has 99 names, but Father is not one of them. Absolutely not. Yeah. Yeah. And look, in those 99 and, names, there, yeah. there, are, there are similarities in the way we would view God. You know, yeah. he's compassionate, he's merciful, whatnot. What 
but being father is the main one, right? Mm. Even when Jesus is demonstrating and manifesting the attributes of God, the first thing he says, our father, mm. the father. He always talks about God being father. Right? So, so that means that can open up the topic of saying, if that's how you see God, mm. then your approach to him would be different, exactly. right? Yes. There's a difference between a slave approaching a master, a master yeah. and a child approaching their father, yeah. right? In, in Christianity, we come to God and Jesus taught us how to pray. Mm. And it starts with our heavenly father. Yeah. So right from the get-go, mm. God, Jesus is teaching us, this is how you approach the God of creation. Right. And this is, what you should call him. Yeah. Say, our heavenly father. With Islam, you have to have a certain ritual. And that's more and of a... it's lifelong. Yeah. It's lifelong. And, it, and, and you know, there's, there's the outweighing balance. So you do good, you know, it's recorded. You do bad, it's recorded. It, it gets weighed on judgment day. And then you will spend a certain amount of time in Jan, in, in, in um, hell. And then maybe you can go to, you know, Jannah. Yeah. Cool. So, so we spoke about the nature of God. We spoke about how we see God in the Bible, in the Quran, which mm. is father and master. We spoke about how we react to that, right? As, mm. as followers, we approach God as our fathers. Muslims mm. approach him as their God and their master. And that's the only thing that they have. Now, what does God of the Bible and Allah of the Quran promise their followers mm. eternally. Well, so this is the this is the crux of it because I've spoken to a lot of Muslims. I'm like, look, I'm a sinner. I have committed some acts against God, against his nature. I'm imperfect. Tell me how I can be saved. What do I need to do? Mm. And I sp- I've, I've asked this so many times and never has there once been a one sentence answer to it. Right, they're like, well, you have to, you have to, you know, obviously, you have to do the shahada, you have to, you know, declare that God is, you know, the one true God and Muhammad is his prophet, and then you have to go on this lifelong journey of following the five pillars of faith, right? And you have to make sure that you you are following all the rituals perfectly, and then at the end, then maybe. Maybe there might be a chance. Yeah. Because right? there was no assurance. No, there's no for assurance. even Muhammad, even Muhammad and Muhammad. his followers. Yeah. Yeah. But now speaking about heaven, let's say you've reached heaven. Mm. What does Allah promise you in heaven? What does the God of the Bible promise Look, you in heaven? I don't I don't want to be crass <clears throat> here. But if you're a man, if you're a man, you get some good promises. Yeah. If you're a woman, you don't. So you get like what, seventy, seventy two virgins? virgins yeah. Um but so the, even the even reason, that the the, yeah. the it's a very carnal pleasure aspect to it. Yeah. And as a servant, it's like, all right, well, you did some good stuff. I'll I'll feed you these women to distract you, but you still don't have a relationship with God. Mm. You know, you're in a certain kind of bliss. It's a carnal bliss. It's a carnal pleasure, but you don't get that spiritual pleasure of communion and fellowship with Allah with God. Yeah. So and that's a big the, thing. Yeah, that that was my point in asking the question is because when you read about eternal life in the Bible, mm. it's not something man would carnally desire no, no, on yeah. earth. It's a spiritual. Yeah. yeah, but when you read about the eternal life in the Quran, mm. it's something that a carnal man would love to have. Yeah. Right? It's the women. It's the desires. It's um. They're, they're drinking as well yeah. because they're forbidden to drink here, but they're they going to be drink it, yeah. drinking in heaven. So the idea is that you're just going to be carnally spoiled. Mm. And to me, that's a big hint as, okay, that's a human mind speaking. Yeah. Yeah. That's not God. So in the Bible, when I read it, I'm like, that's not a human way of speaking, mm. right? If for a human being we would design a different God. Yeah, yeah. And to me, I look at the Quran and be like, oh yeah, that's something a human being can design. Yeah. It's something that is all about carnality. If you love, you know, sex and fornication and, and so on, this well, is this is it. This is your religion because you are promised, for example, to a man four wives. They need to be submissive in, in the sense of 
submissive as an animal, right? They could be beaten. And once you get to heaven, you could have more women, more pleasure. And the more you sleep with them, they go back to being virgins as well. Yeah. So there's that very yeah. sick it's mindset it's behind carnal. it. It's very yeah. carnal. So I think that's a good point. Yeah. What would be the last thing you want to share to a person that says, hmm, I think both religions are okay and we're all people well, and all religions will follow. You can, but concerning you, Islam and yeah, Christianity. You, 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 like we said earlier, you can't violate the law of non-contradiction. These are two separate ideologies, two separate theologies, two separate um, soteriologies. So like when you talk about the, the ideology of any kind of religion, we disagree on every point, every single point. Okay, the nature of God, the nature of salvation, the nature of God, uh, relationship with one another, the the nature of the way that you you structure your life on earth, it's all different. It's all different. And when we look at what Christ says about eternal life, he, you know, John seventeen three, he says, "This is eternal life that they may know you, God the Father, and me, the one you have sent." Right? That's what eternal life will look like for us. Eternal life looks very different, like you were you were t uh, speaking about with Islam. That it's a very carnal eternal life, and that's not true. Eternal life, eternal life is to know God. And so I'm like, well, what's your goal in knowing God? In wanting to follow God, what's your goal? Is your end goal to have your carnal pleasures, um, you know, kind of fulfilled in it, in in heaven, or is it to actually be with God and have fellowship with Him? Mm. Because both these both these religions will, are promising one thing. It's either eternal life in fellowship with God or eternal life in, you know, fulfilling the desires of your flesh. Um, but I, I also say, well, do you want one that is going to give you also peace on earth, peace here now, where we have fellowship with God in the Holy Spirit? Or do you want one where you are going to live life unsure as to whether you're even going to make it? Because there is no religion that gives you that assurance. Even with modern day Judaism, I mean, you you listen to some of the Orthodox Jews; it's a similar thing, right? But we're speaking on Islam here. You don't get that assurance, and like, why why am I following something? Why am I depriving myself in life if I don't even know if I'm going to make it? Like, what what's what's the incentive there? Yeah. You know? But with Christianity, it the work has been done by Christ, and now we follow out of our reborn nature, out of our new nature, and. We have this assurance by the Spirit. He sealed us and we know we are, He called His sons. We are adopted. And so it begins here. It's not something we only look forward to. Yes, we do, but we have that presence here. And so you give them that choice and you're like, it's up to you. Look, I'm not going to convince you. It's the Holy Spirit who convicts you of righteousness, judgment, but the Word of God. I'm going to preach to you what the truth is. Great. Yeah. So I just encourage you to have that unity in truth and not political unities or yeah. religious unities. Um, as the Bible says, if you don't believe in the doctrine of Christ, you cannot have the Father. Mm. So it's very important. Christ is the center of this discussion. Yeah. If you don't believe that God, Christ is divine, the Son of God, then you don't have anything to do with the Father. It's those who come to Christ that are able to come to the Father. Without Christ, you could call God Allah, you could call God anything, you could serve God in any way you like, you do not have salvation. There is no salvation outside of Christ, and that's what I would like to share. So to Christians, I would like to encourage you to be more bold in what you believe in, mm -hmm. and make those distinctions. Don't just believe in unity for the sake of unity. Yeah. Only be united to the people of God. Don't try and add more people into the kingdom because that's false conversion. Yeah. They're not going to be part of who God is. So, yeah, that's what we have today. We'll uh, hopefully you've enjoyed it. God bless you. Take care.